Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, we've got a great program tonight. Um, to briefly introduce Families for Climate, our mission is to mobilize parents, kids, and families to take action for climate justice and a livable planet. We're a two-year-old volunteer-powered organization, and in the last few months, we've launched the Parents Climate Action Network, PECAN for short, as our advocacy arm to help support more parents, grandparents, teachers, caregivers, et cetera, to become leaders in the climate movement. There are so many people invested in the futures of the young folks in their lives who are not yet engaged in this work and Families for Climate across our organization and through the Parents Climate Action Network is here to support them to get off the sidelines and jump in. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our PCAN manager, Jamie Painter, to introduce the program tonight. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, thanks Leonard. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take a minute just to talk a little bit about what's at stake this legislative session and why we're all here. I mean, first off, we have a bill that could reduce carbon emissions from the building sector, the second largest source of carbon emissions in Oregon after transportation. We have two bills aimed um, at working to make sure Oregon's, Oregonians can stay cool as we experience more heat waves, a bill that would provide farm workers who work on the front lines of climate change and the heat and wildfire smoke um, to make sure we have food to feed our families, making sure they have access to overtime benefits that workers in every other industry have. And finally, a bill that would work to um, allow the public to see whether or not our state investments line up with Oregon values. All really important. And it's gonna take all of us working together to really get these bills across the finish line in the next four and a half weeks. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce our panelists. Um, I'm really excited to have some amazing um, folks who have a lot of big wins under their belts, a lot of great experience. who are really gonna help us know how we can make a difference this session and really engage um, in a meaningful way that's effective. So first off, uh, we have Brad Reed, who um, has been working as the campaign manager for Renew Oregon. We have Julia DeGraw, who um, joins us from the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. They actually work to help get pro-environment candidates elected um, and also to pass um, pro-environment -envi legislation. And then we have Nora Apner, who is the um, climate policy manager for the Oregon Environmental Council and really helps organize a lot of the organizations working on climate issues. So thank you all so much for being here. I wanna jump in because we don't have that much time this evening. Um, and I think tonight we're gonna start with media engagement. So I'll start with some questions for Brad. Um, Brad, uh, is it fair to, you, you previously before um, jumping into politics were a journalist, is that right? That's right, yeah, yeah. I worked uh, in television news in uh, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina and Portland uh, about 10 years, won an Emmy award and then uh, retired to get into politics. <laughs> You're so cool. Um, so here, we'll, and because we have so many different people, some people are very comfortable writing letters to the editor and know how to engage the media. Some people um, don't know what I mean when I say LTE. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the things that help letters to the editor or LTEs or opinion editorials kind of stand out um, and get published? Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to start by saying how important um, those kind of, I call them placed media pieces are. Uh, we try really hard to talk to reporters to get them to cover our issues um, in a good way, in a positive and helpful way. Um, but there are so many, there are so fewer of them uh, anymore. Uh, as media shrinks um, that they can't either get to it or um, you know, we can't get their attention. So these pieces really help um, them see what the public's interested in. So you write a letter to the editor, someone tr truly doesn't read it, it goes somewhere. Uh, and that, effect, that, that affects their opinion of what the public's interested in, um, what they wanna hear about. And so those are really helpful activist tools um, it's not just going to an email box that nobody's checking or something like that. Um, so in a way, it's it's lobbying the media 
to be able to, to get those pieces in. Um, the other thing is when a letter to the editor is printed, um, it, it gives it some legitimacy. Like an editor checked it out. They saw that it's within the realm of sane, depending on the outlet. <laughs> Uh, and, but then you, you get a nice URL, like at organlive.com has posted this thing, then we can all share it on social media with um, some credibility behind it. So all of those reasons make these really effective tools that I think it's a little old school, but um, really worthwhile to do. Um, to the specific question, uh, an op-ed is uh, a longer form piece that uh, is usually five to 600 words. Uh, the editor kind of chooses how long they will accept. Um, those tend to be more from some sort of expertise, whether it's a lived experience or professional background. Um, they'll be looking for, you're saying something that um, you have some credibility on. And so those tend to be more reserved. There's less space for them. Um, editors can be pickier about them, um, but they can be really powerful. You can make your long, you, you know, make a long argument um, in five, 600 words. A letter to the editor generally is much shorter, um, between two and 300 words. Um, but those, uh, especially as an activist tool, can be something you can do in bulk. Um, anyone can do, any citizen, you know, who lives usually in the community, sometimes doesn't even have to be in the community. Uh, can send in a letter to the editor and you can usually send uh, one or two a month um, before you get cut off. <laughs> um, so those are kind of, that's the basic difference. Um, both of them can be very powerful and, and you know, well-written. Um, yeah, I think that's the answer to that question. That's great. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about it a little bit, but in terms of like, other ways you can share out these LTEs that were getting published. Um, you know, obviously you can share them on social media. You could email your legislator um, just to make sure that they're seeing it. Any other um, ways you like to see people um, repurpose letters to the editors or op-eds? Those are great examples. Yeah, send them to your legislator for sure. Um, get them on social. Make sure to share them like with the activists uh, that you know that have, uh, you know, groups like ours have spent um, time and resources to get big social media followings. And so make sure that we see it and then we can share it and we're happy to. That's awesome. Thanks, Brad. Um, besides the Oregonian, um, what are other news outlets that are good to, to target? Uh, it all depends where you live. If you live within sort of the coverage area of a paper, you live in Corvallis, Eugene, Salem, Medford, Ashland, Bend, um, they love to prioritize letters and op-eds from people who live in the community. Um, so that's a real bonus. Um, in Portland, if, if we're talking, you know, we got a concentration here. Uh, I think Willamette Week still prints letters sometimes. Um, Portland Mercury is a good one. And then there are actually, there are some neighborhood papers that run by the Pamphlet Media Group um, in Southwest Portland, I think. Um, and, you know, all the suburbs, Beaverton, Hillsborough, Forest Grove, Gresham, Oregon City, Milwaukee. That's awesome. Do people still, um, are there still blogs that are, is that still a thing? I'm such a dinosaur. I remember when it was like really cool if you could get a blogger to pick up your story. Not so much for like Oregon politics. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of journalists now who do newsletters and things like that. Um, there's a couple kicking around. I think there's one called the Oregon Way um, that's kind of picked up a little bit, um, but I don't think not, not as much as it, there used to be 10, 20 years ago. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have a, a cheat sheet for you that we'll be sharing um, a little bit later on with um, some of the email addresses of where you would submit an LTE and just some um, handy hints 
Um, so we'll be sharing that in a minute. Um, but I know a lot of you are really excited about how you engage your legislators. And so we want to jump right into that. Um, and bear with me, I'm not the best at Zoom, but we are going to try to, um, I'm going to try to share um, Julia's presentation. Does anyone know any good jokes while I'm doing that? No, no, okay. I'll, I'll just try to think of one. Here we go. I'm now unmuted, but I am not good in the jokes category. <laughs> <laughs> I say goofy things from time to time, but <laughs> that that's okay um has anything crazy or funny happened in any of the hearings you've been um watching julia oh my goodness mostly just the usual like people thinking that they're not muted but they are there's the occasional people being not muted when they should be muted and and it's just like you know distracting, nothing too juicy, but the usual Zoom stuff. <laughs> it even happens in hearings. Okay, I'm almost there, I promise. Okay, so now I... I'm seeing some, some folks in the audience. Um, my kind of tutorial on how to testify might be a little, um, beginner for some of you, but I think it's always good um, in a virtual session to have like visuals of like exactly <laughs> what does it actually look like? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what this is about. Um, in terms of what's the best way to engage your legis legislator, um, this is some of the really great ways you can do it is um, written testimony. Um, and so this is a uh, just real one-on-one, -on -one, 101 on how to, to um, participate in a virtual session and get your written testimony submitted on a bill that you are supporting. In this case, uh, I, I did say um, bills you're supporting or opposing, but it's like, because there's a lot of bills in the legislative session you might want to weigh in on, but in terms of these climate bills, you're going to be very much in favor of them. So you're obviously going to want to um, you know, start out by addressing the legislator that you're trying to speak to, um, introducing yourself, the part of Portland you're from, or the part of Oregon, excuse me, that you're from. Um, explain why you're writing, right? Define the, um, the problem and, and what the bill could do to solve the problem. Um, and then urge them to vote yes on the bill. It's like really straightforward. Um, generally, it's good to be um, concise. Uh, they have a lot of bills. Uh, that they're looking over and um, they're not gonna always take the time to read really long testimony. So it's good and it's okay to keep it short. And um, and all the organizations that are leading on these bills that uh, have been highlighted have uh, talking points and one pagers and, and, and materials that can help you draft this message. But what you can do is bring your personal take to it so that you can personalize the message, um, which is always more powerful than just copying and pasting something. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so this is just a sample. Um, I uh, stole this from the Farm Work Overtime folks who prepared a really wonderful training on how to submit testimony. So uh, this is a sample of what that testimony could look like. Um, I think we can move on to the next section. So uh, this is just things to think about as you're submitting testimony. It is uh, public information. It is part of the public record. Um, that's kind of why it's so powerful is you're making sure that you know the legislature and the public knows how many people feel strongly about this bill. That said, you know, don't say anything inflammatory in there that you don't want the world to see or um, say something personal that you don't want people to know about you or share your, you know, home address or any really personal information because it is a public um, information. Um, and lastly, you wanna make sure that you're uploading your testimony 
um, in a timely manner. Uh, once a hearing has been scheduled, you have within 24 hours of that meeting starting uh, to submit your testimony. So basically from the moment that the bill is posted to be heard for uh, public testimony to the 24 hours after the meeting is the time that you have to electronically, electronically submit testimony. And I personally, as a lobbyist have been guilty of like submitting the testimony like a minute after the deadline and did not get to submit my testimony, which was not great. So I urge you to err on the side of giving yourself a buffer time there. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so yeah, and this is just to give folks the visual. Um, you, go, you go to the OLIS um, website. If you literally Google OLIS, um, it will show up right there at the top, which is really handy. Um, and you would, uh, once you've clicked through to committees, which is the circle at the top up here, you can select the committee um, that your bill is in and, um, and you can uh, click to submit testimony on that page. Um, there's actually a couple of different ways to navigate to it, but this is one, one of the ways to do it. And then the next slide, um, you wanna select the meeting time and date. Um, just kind of gives you an idea of what the page actually looks like. Um, the next slide. Um, and here is uh, the page where you would, um, once you've selected the, the meeting time and the date and you select the bill that you want to actually submit your testimony on and you enter your name, uh, if you're submitting this on behalf of just yourself, you will want to enter the city that you live in. If you're representing an organization, you would say you're submitting the um, testimony on behalf of an organization. Um, and then you can upload your testimony or you can drop it into the text box. The, the text box does have character limits, um, but again, hopefully your comment is short and sweet. Um, or you can upload a PDF. Um, so those are the options there. Um, and then once you submit it, uh, you'll have to fill out a CAPTCHA to prove that you are not a robot, and uh, and you'll be in the you'll have submitted your testimony. Um, so next slide. Um, I think that might be a repeat. There we go. So, and this is if you want to testify live. So, in addition to getting your testimony in in writing, you can actually sign up in advance to testify at the hearing. Um, generally, legislators will give you two to three minutes to to say something, and we, at, you know, generally you want to prepare your statement. It'll probably be some version of what you submitted in writing, um, and uh, and this is definitely, you know, a much higher level of action where you're actually going to attend as a member of the public and put your your statement into the record um, before the actual legislators themselves during a public hearing, and uh, you'll go to the uh, the committee page that we you, you saw the page earlier where that had that circle for committee and you click on committee and then there's a calendar on the side of the 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 screen and you can click on the meeting date uh for uh the the when the hearing is going to be happening and on that page you can select register online uh to testify register to testify remotely click on that link and it'll lead you to this next page so the next slide um, and this is in the middle of the, of the page, like at the top of the page, you're going to be filling out your name, which, um, where you're from, just that really basic, basic information. And then here you're going to select which bill you want to speak to and whether or not you're for, against, or neutral on that bill. And then you hit submit. And again, there'll be a CAPTCHA and, uh, um, one more step you have to take to officially sign up. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Um, this little screen will pop up and I'm just going to confess to my own personal struggle with this. <laughs> if I don't copy and paste this and drop it into a calendar event at the time of the hearing, at always moments before the hearing, I'm scrambling in my email, desperately searching for an email with the link to the event. And I'm like minutes late to the hearing because I can't find the email and I'm frantic. So I just really recommend you will get an email with this information confirming that you've signed up. This is your link to get into the kind of back end of the meeting where you'll actually be able to speak. Um, if you just join the meeting from um, the OLIS website, you're just observing it passively. 
this is the link that's for you to attend the meeting in a um, Microsoft Teams meeting where you can you know, unmute yourself and actually speak. So you, this is a really important link. I personally drop it in the calendar event so I don't mess it up, um, but you will get an email confirming this as well. Um, but this is the link that you'd wanna use if you're gonna end up testifying um, live uh, during a public hearing. So that is it for the kind of like, here's what the screens actually look like and how to do the thing, like literally. Um, so thanks for bearing with me through that. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that was definitely very helpful, Julia. Um, so on that note, we are going to talk a little bit more about different things um, that are impactful and help make your case when you are talking to legislators. Um, so Nora, I want to turn it over to you for a minute. Um, just heard, you know, how you actually testify both um, live and in written testimony. Um, we talked a little bit about letters to the editor, but when you are going to engage um, legislators, what do you think is the most impactful? Is it a phone call, a letter, a personal email, um, an actual meeting? Um, and Nora, will you talk a little bit about your experience? Because you have served for a member of Congress. Um, so you have personal experience with this. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question, Jamie. Um, I would think about engaging your So I can say that there's um, one better way to engage your legislators. I think consistency is really key. Um, we know that um, our decision makers in the legislature and in Congress are being asked um, to do various things on a million different issues <clears throat> in, an, in, in any given day. And so um, making sure that climate is staying at the top of their inboxes or their call logs um, and that they're consistently hearing from their constituents that they expect and want um, action from their representatives is really important. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, I, I did work for several years for um, one of our US senators and um, I can say we didn't consider a phone call different from a letter versus an email. Um, that being said, I think that you can make sure that you're getting all of your points across maybe a little bit easier in an email form. Um, and it's always important to kind of balance um, quantity versus quality. So maybe you have a bunch of, bunch of issues that you want to make sure that you're, you're writing to your legislator about. Um, and you know you have a bunch of forms maybe that you have been sent to you. Those those are really impactful. It is important that our decision makers are hearing from a large number of constituents about an issue. Um, but it certainly um, makes it a it more impactful to have those personal stories. You know why you care about these issues, um, and that that can actually impact how it's recorded. Um, and what type of response and level of engagement you get from your decision maker. Um, I know oftentimes if we got a, a form letter, we would either delete it or respond with a, a form response. If you have something that's more personalized, um, that's gonna merit more of a personal response and therefore more time that either a staff person or a legislator is, is thinking about the issue that you're writing to them or calling them about. Um, yeah, so I, you know, you can't go wrong, but certainly the more that you're able to personalize it, um, the more of an impact you can have. Wonderful, thank you, Nora. Um, Julia, um, next question we'll have for you. Um, are there things you should avoid when you're communicating with legislators? Um, and specifically, what do you do if your legislator tells you they don't support your bill? Yeah, that stuff is is hard and a little bit heartbreaking when it happens. Um, it kind of, um, I think that where this is the most challenging is if you are actually in an in-person meeting with your legislator. Say you actually get a lobby meeting with your legislator and you're having that 
face to face or screen to screen interaction. Um, uh, what I'm going to say, I think, is, is going to be pretty obvious, but it's like you you always want to behave in a way that's respectful. Um, I, I think that you also shouldn't be afraid to be direct. Um, sometimes legislators don't want to say no, so they like skirt around the issue. And it's actually better if you can get like a real answer from them that's concrete. Um, and and it's always good to ask maybe one follow up question that, you know, is there something uh, that could get you to yes? Is there is there something to be changed in this bill? Um, uh, you know, just like getting getting some kind of level of commitment or agreement out of the situation um, so that you can um, continue to have a, a, a relationship. Right. So I think that um, especially as long as uh, everyone, including the legislators, being respectful in that space, you're leaving the door open for continued conversation and, and learning. Um, so, uh, but I think that that's the, the number one goal there is, is not being afraid of being direct um, and sincere in your, in, your, in your actions and in your requests. But then once you get that direct and sincere answer to be respectful and, and to respectfully disagree and, and keep the, um, the relationship going, because at some point, that legislator might be with you on something, right? And at some point they might even get to yes on this issue. Um, and they did so because you, you know, didn't just get mad at them, right? So. That's great. In my, in my um, days as a lobbyist, one of the things that I remember was there was a legislator who would always meet with me. Um, he never supported any of my bills, but he would always give me really interesting info about his caucus or like concerns that he'd heard um, his colleagues raise. And so even though I never got his vote, I did get really good information. And so it's helpful, I think, to remember that even if your legislator um, isn't going to vote for the bill, they might tell you stuff that's useful to know. Um, oh, that actually makes me think of one other thing as well. I mean, if you are meeting with legislators on a more regular basis, if they remember who you are, like connect with them on that personal level ask about how their dog is doing you know what i mean it's like if you're um uh be, before I, I i got this job there were some legislators that I interacted with a lot and and we would talk about our lives and we would run into each other at events sometimes and and so i think that's the other thing too is i mean obviously if you have a 15 minute meeting and you're talking about a thing it's like a limited amount of time but I, I don't be afraid of, of taking that moment to just be human, you know, with your legislator, because um, I think that that helps um, on multiple levels in terms of being able to be persuasive and have a, a, a quality relationship with them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I get this is kind of for all of you. How, what's the best way to, for folks to track bills and to know when hearings are coming up? Obviously they'll get emails from our organizations, but um, any tips for tracking bills? And maybe I'll start with you, Julia, since you're in the building every day. In the building. <laughs> in the building, virtually. Um, I'm I'm kind of chagrined to say that as a lobbyist, um, I should be using this handy dandy tool called Bill Tracker. And every time I try to use it, I don't get notifications. So I just do it the old fashioned way. Um, I don't know if it's the best way to do it, but I have to track so many bills and so many different committees that um, pretty much every Sunday I go into OLIS. I have a list of my committees that have all, where all my bills are. And I just like start in the Senate and I check out what's going on in uh, energy and environment. I click on it, I click on the um, committee bubble, I like go down to Senate, I select the correct committee. And then um, on the right hand side of the screen, you have that um, all the meeting times that are scheduled and you can click on the meeting date and time and you'll get the agenda for the meeting. And that's where I can tell which bills are moving and which bills um, have work sessions or hearings, and um, and that's how I do it. It's pretty old school. I just manually go through. You can sign up to get email notifications about these as well. Um, that really works well for some people. Um, my email feels completely <laughs> a little bit out of control sometimes. That's not always the best way for me personally. I actually find that it's better to go in and manually do it. But you can also go into OLIS and manually sign up to get updates on your specific bills. And if you're only tracking a few bills, 
I think that's actually a really effective way to do it. I should have done screenshots for that. I apologize, everyone. But you can go into OLIS and get um, signups for notifications about when your specific bill is moving. And that's a really convenient way to find out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll Nora, um, I'll, I'll give you this question. Um, sometimes it can be really discouraging. Um, and I'd love to hear, you know, how, you know, is the work that we're doing with engaging with our legislators and writing our LTEs, um, attending town halls, is it making a difference? And um, how do we know our actions are having an impact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if, if you're feeling discouraged, that, you know, you're not alone. Um, this, this type of work advocacy um, takes a lot of persistence and patience. Um, really at whatever level of government you're working at. Um, so that that's normal. And um, there is there is a light at the end of the terminal. And we have a lot of recent examples where we've seen our advocacy pay off in, in really significant ways. Um, I think maybe before we turn to some of the specific like tangible policy results that we've had recently, I would say one way um, that you can kind of gauge whether your advocacy is working is listening to your representatives. Um, I think you, you really know that you, you're doing a good job when you hear your elected officials kind of singing from the same songbook and kind of talking, um, using the same talking points that you've said to them maybe in a previous meeting. Um, we've seen a lot of that I think particularly around, you know, some of the federal advocacy with Build Back Better where, um, you know, certain uh, senators or representatives that maybe weren't super big on, you know, climate and jobs and justice a few years ago are repeating that over and over. And that's kind of, you can, you can see full circle how um, that consistency and emphasis in terms of um, showing up again and again to town halls and writing um, our elected officials is um, paying off and that um, those, those representatives are now saying, you know, speaking our language um, and talking to their colleagues about it. So I think listening to um, those talking points is, is a good way to gauge um, how effective we're, we're, we're being in moving the needle. Um, and of course, real action in terms of um, decision makers actually adopting the policies and making the changes that we're asking them to. Um, and I'm happy to, to talk about that, but maybe that's later on in the agenda. Yeah, um, that's a great segue into um, kind of talking about some of the key takeaways from last year. It was a big year for climate and um, you three did a lot of amazing work to, to help with some of those wins. I'm hoping you can maybe say, you know, something that you're proud of from, from last year um, and maybe a key takeaway from those efforts. And um, Brad, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, and I actually have an example that uh, is not legislative so that uh, folks understand that there's plenty of opportunities around at the calendar, uh, not just when legislators are in session. Um, Renew Oregon really focused our work in the last two years on the executive branch. Um, many of you may know, uh, Governor Brown signed an executive order called the Oregon Climate Action Plan in 2020, um, but it took a lot of work and a lot of community engagement to uh, really make sure that all of that was followed through on that agencies uh, heard from people that they want the rules to be really good. And so um, one of the cornerstone pieces was called the Climate Protection Program. You probably got emails from all of us on it <laughs> if you're signed up for the list. But um, we ended up as a community, just as a, a movement, um, getting something like 5,000 comments into the Department of Environmental Quality uh, which just blew their minds. I mean, it's, it's 10 times more than they usually get on rule, like these kind of obscure rulemaking processes that they do. And it was because uh, 
like Families for Climate held an event and we did uh, testimony writing. And so we did uh, like 25 of those, I think uh, all over the state uh, and people took the time to write those comments. And at the end of the day, uh, the staff at DEQ was able to say, we made these rules stronger because we heard overwhelmingly from Oregonians that that's what they wanted. And so all the pushback from the well-heeled industry, uh, all of their lobbying tricks, all their threats, uh, we overcame that and we couldn't have without each individual person setting in a piece of uh, commentary. Uh, and so that's like, that's the result. And so that was, we were really proud of that. And people who have worked in, in kind of regulatory spaces, that, that executive side, they all were just shaking their head like, rules don't get stronger. This <laughs> never happens. And so we were just so proud of that entire effort because uh, it got stronger at the end. And um, now we're one of the a handful of states that have just a hard cap on carbon emissions. They're going to come down every year. That's awesome. Julia, you want to give an example? I was like literally the one that I was thinking of, but I couldn't have given that level of detail. Um, uh, um, and I actually, I did, this is a mild tangent, but I did see a question in the chat that I feel really compelled to, to answer. So um, I am going to take my time, I think, to do that real quick. Um, there's a really good question about what is the process, uh, public hearing first, and then when does it go to the floor? So that's a really good question. Uh, so and, and in order for a bill to uh, ultimately get voted on, there's a few different paths that it can take. Um, it can start in the House or the Senate, and it gets assigned to a committee. And in order to move out of that committee, it has to get scheduled for a public hearing. Um, and then it also has to get scheduled after that public hearing for a work session. And sometimes they can combine a, a public hearing and a work session all together in one day in the same meeting, but it has to be posted and scheduled and there's deadlines associated with this throughout the legislative session. Um, if it gets uh, a work session and the uh, committee members agree to vote it out of committee, um, that bill will either then move to the floor um, or if it has uh, revenue implications, it'll go to revenue. If it has um, a fiscal associated with it, it has to go to ways and means. So a lot of our bills that we really care about are impactful and impactful things usually take money. So a lot of our bills go to ways and means. And so once a bill gets to ways and means, it has to, it often gets assigned to a subcommittee within ways and means. Um, um, it has to work its way through that entire committee, which is a joint committee between the House and the Senate. Um, and then once it, uh, and then in order to like, get voted on on the floor, it has to actually get out of ways and means. So it'll go back to the chamber if we do succeed in getting it through ways and means, it'll go back to the chamber that it came out of is my impression and hopefully I'm not getting this wrong. Um, and, and, that, and it will be voted on the floor of that chamber. So if it came from a Senate committee, it'll go back to the Senate, the Senate will vote on it and then that'll pop it over to the house. And um, in the short session, um, I think, it depends that bill can either uh you know if it's fully vetted and ready to go just go to the floor of the house if they feel there needs to be more work on it which could be really challenging in a short session it might get assigned to a committee where it gets uh you know additional hearings um and then eventually might go to the floor of, of that chamber as well so um that is a real quick and dirty but it's like it has to have a public hearing it has to have a work session and then it either goes to the floor or it's next committee that has to go to to keep keep moving and it has to be voted on in both chambers so that's the quick answer that was so great thank you so much sorry i was having a little coughing attack so i had to disappear for a second um did you want to share any um key takeaways or do you want us to turn over to nora I think I'll turn it over to Nora. I'd love to hear what her, her key takeaway is. Me too, Nora. Um, and we're just still on key takeaways from the last year. Yeah, anything that you thought really made a difference or worked really well? Um, anything you wish you'd done differently? 
Um, always things that we could do differently, always areas to improve. But um, I, I would say, well, I want to third the climate protection program um, just to emphasize the importance of engaging in rulemakings. I think people's eyes often glaze over when they hear that word. Um, and it really is such a critical part of the democratic process. It's where our laws get ironed out and either watered down or in this case strengthened. And that is because we had such incredible continued public engagement through the very end. So do you wanna just give one more shout out to engaging in um, agency rulemaking processes? But um, yeah, as you said, Jamie, there was um, just such remarkable progress um, also through the legislature last year. Um, and I, th I think it was even more remarkable because we were operating in really an unprecedented um, sort of legislative situation. Nobody has ever been through a virtual um, session before. And so there was a lot of kind of learning on the fly. Um, it was actually my first uh, session at all <laughs> in the Oregon legislature. So um, a lot of just trying to figure out, you know, how, how are you staying in touch with your partners? staying in touch with legislative champions when you aren't passing people in the hallways and able to have kind of the water cooler conversations where you pick up intel and are able to you know lift up a bill that you're working on or want support on kind of in passing you really have to stay on top of it in terms of consistent conversations um consistent communication with again your your partners legislators um, so I think it really underscored just how important intentional communication and coordination is. Um, and I really wish we had Oriana um, with Verde on us uh, with us tonight because she really was just um, such an, an impressive leader of um, the OCO campaign that really led um, the effort on the 100% clean electricity bill, HB 2021 that passed last year. Um, as well as the, the two complementary bills, Healthy Homes and Energy Affordability, which also passed last year um, and are you know, paving the way for our electric grid to be 100% clean, um, so powered by 100% non-emitting sources by 2040. So we're now tied with New York to um, have the fastest transition um, to an 100% clean electricity grid in the state. And again, I think um, that just speaks to the incredible organizing um, that uh, our environmental justice partners led and that really, you know, consistent coordination, communication with folks that were, were bought in and the really diverse um, group of stakeholders that were involved in that. Um, so it wasn't, you know, only climate and environmental justice groups, but labor partners who are at the table, um, utilities who are at the table, utility consumer advocates, um, and just uh, really applaud Oriana and the, the whole um, coalition that was leading the way on that. Lot, lots of, um, lots to be proud of coming out of 2021. Now I have a thing I wanna say in response to your question, if I can. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Okay, so um, I love that you said that because I was going to talk about the Oregon Clean Energy Opportunity Bills as well. Um, it was an unprecedented coalition um, uh, that really made that a reality and laid the found foundation for what we're doing now. And a lot of the same groups in Oriana's leadership is, is leading to um, these emergency heat relief bill bills that are in a really good position this session to pass. And so this kind of new bigger, broader coalition movement building kind of style of passing bills is like proving to be really effective and powerful. And it's really exciting to see how, you know, what happens in a previous session really lays the foundation for what can happen in future sessions. And or uh, um, Nora just did a really good job of laying out how that was really getting at the electric grid and electricity. And like the next one of the next two big things that we have to tackle on climate are buildings, which are the number uh, two source of energy, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the state and transportation, which is number one, right? So that it's like, we can't just think about legislative sessions in these in, in like a vacuum. We are, everything we do each session is building toward the thing we need to be doing in future sessions, not just in terms of the legislation we have to pass, 
but the coalitions that we're building and the power that we're building to help affect that change. Um, and I'm new to this as well in this position. I've been around for a while on this, um, but like in, in general, but like I haven't been in this position um, uh, anytime then under, under COVID. You know, my entire experience working in the legislation in the legislature is virtual. And, um, and so I'll just wrap up with this last thought, which is it's been a double-edged sword, right? It's really increased the participation level of members of the public from all over the state because they don't have to drive to the Capitol to testify or participate. So people are showing up and testifying in, in these huge numbers. And, and even, you know, Senator Courtney, who thought he was going to hate it, was like, oh, this, 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 like, this Zoom thing is amazing, you know? <laughs> he was like, he doesn't want to do phone calls anymore, right? So, so it's like, you know, there, there, there was something to it. However, for those of us that are more in the building and, and doing the lobbying work, it's become a cell phone game. If you don't have a staff or cell phone, you're not gonna run into them on the hallway, in the hallway. They don't have to answer your call. They don't have to respond to your text, right? So, so on, on that level, there's like less access and, um, and it's really, your, your, you have to have really good quality relationships for people be, to be responsive to you and just have to have their like actual cell phone. <laughs> so it's funny how it's in some ways it's really increased the democratic process and in other ways it's made it harder to have access. But it's, uh, it's really been, I think uh, the legislature has learned that democracy needs to be virtual on some level in order for there to be adequate public participation which is exciting. Wow, well, thank you all so much. I realize we have 12 minutes left and I wanna make sure that we're answering questions from the audience. Um, and Nora um, Lehman is gonna help me um, pull some questions. So if you wanna post any questions you have in the chat, we'll be um, working working um, from the chat list, or you can raise your hand as well. Um, and I'm yeah. really excited for Oriana to see um, this video and see how much love she got from all of you. That's so great. Jimmy, if we can, uh, as folks are thinking of their questions, if I could just jump off of something that I like hearing Julia uh, and Nora talk and bringing it back to how folks can engage themselves. Um, I think, Part of it is kind of demystifying some of this. Um, I want everyone to know that you you have expertise uh, and that you don't need to know climate policy inside and out. Um, we all lived through the heat dome this summer. That means you have of a lived experience to share. We all have breathed wildfire smoke in the last couple of years. You have an experience to share. If you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, you have something to share. And so that's really all it takes. And then to share the stories um, is really powerful. And like, and then taking action yourself, like that 100% clean electricity bill passed, I think on the last day of the session, like it came down to the wire, but we got thousands of emails. And again, like without each individual person taking action, uh, doesn't add up to anything, right? And so all the stuff that we, the professionals did running around, texting staffers and stuff, like w they only take our texts because they know that there are thousands of people behind us. And so, you know, just to bring it back to the personal participation and um, don't feel like you need to know all the answers. It's really on your elected officials to know the answers. Like you, <laughs> they work for you. So you say, I want climate action because this is scary and terrible. What are you gonna do for me? Like that's the only thing that you really need to go with. <laughs> and so anyway, onto the Q and A, but um, yeah, here in the uh, YouTube talk reminded me of that. Yeah, that's really great to hear. Thanks for, for saying that so clearly and concisely, Brad, that, you know, expertise is not needed lived experience is really valid and so important. Um, and in that sense, like we're all climate experts now, um, you know, sadly. <laughs> um, a great question from Katie in the chat. I feel lucky that most of my legislators are very supportive of climate policy and many of the bills I support. Is it important to still reach out to legislators who are supportive of these efforts or is my energy best 
used elsewhere. Um, Legislators I'm just gonna, get, yeah, anyone can take that one. <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. <laughs> Legislators get yelled at a lot by people all the time from lots of different angles. And when you are pleased with your legislator or you're expecting them to be good on an issue, but you don't know where they're at, like they they definitely, I think, appreciate knowing that 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 they're doing something that their constituents want them to do. And, and feeling appreciated is something that very seldom happens. Um, and uh, it's a pretty big, often thankless job that legislators do. Uh, you know, it's, it's a citizen, citizen uh, legislature. It doesn't pay. They're not doing it for the money. <laughs> um, they're doing it to serve. And um, and I think when you can um, express not just when you want something from them, but that you appreciate them, that's very powerful for them and helps keep them going. And I would add to that, uh, there's a difference between being a supporter and being a champion of an issue. And with less than a decade remaining to cut our emissions in half, we need leadership. And so it's not really enough for our legislators to support a policy proposal once it's already been introduced. We need them to go to Brad's point we need them to tell us what they are doing and what they are championing to address this crisis. And they're not going to do that unless they have constituents consistently demanding and asking that they be proactive and they be leaders. Um, so it's really, really important that you are reaching out to your legislators, even if they're supportive, they need to be doing more. So definitely do not stop reaching out to them. Yeah, and you know, to that effect, actually, uh, I think that's a really nicely put. Um, Noel put in the chat that one thing Families for Climate is doing as an initiative this month is to send your climate. If you have legislators who are climate champions or who are supporting these really important bills, to send them a Valentine saying thank you, because I think um, you know we do often say you know do this, do this, do this. No, don't do that, don't do that. And then I would imagine probably the follow up rate of folks, and I'm guilty of this, of forgetting to thank my legislators when they do, you know, vote for things. Um, so that's just a sweet way to just sort of thank your legislators, remind them to keep voting for climate bills. Um, we made a cute little template so your kiddos can cut out hearts and color them in. Um, and having your kids send artwork is, you know, probably a nice change for legislators than, you know, long uh, diatribes. So that's always a great way to engage in a, in a positive way. Um, and I see some more, um, and the, uh, the link is in the, in the chat. If you'd like to print out the template for those Valentines, please feel free to do that. It's also on our website. Um, Brian says, I belong to several nonprofit groups. Um, when contacting legislators, what is more effective speaking for one group or many, and then I'm just going to tack on, or because I think a lot of us sort of belong or volunteer to different groups. And so, yeah, should you say I'm as a volunteer or representative of this group or just for myself or how to kind of place yourself when you're doing this kind of advocacy? A constituent is the most powerful contact. So if you live in a representative's or a senator's district, you want to represent yourself. You know, if you happen to be a member of a group, um, that's great. You can talk about how you're, you're representing their interests, but you're coming to them as a constituent. They serve you. Um, they are they are working for you, and and they they will prioritize you too if your legislator is good. <laughs> They'll prioritize um, meeting and, and hearing from you. Yeah, I would echo that 100%. There's a reason why environmental advocacy groups, both in Oregon and at the national level, have lobby days or fly-ins where they bring constituents to talk about issues. You know, we, we talk to legislators all the time, but it's not the same as a constituent coming to them and saying, this matters to me. So um, yeah, 100%, as a constituent, you, you hold the power. Great question, Brian. Um, we've got a couple more minutes. Does anyone else have any questions that they are dying to ask? Um, or oh, I, Emily has, I recently moved to Yamhill County. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to best focus my advocacy out here in rural, uh, rural society. Any suggestions? Oh, that's a great question, Emily. 
Great. I will say that uh, as a rural Oregonian, you unfortunately your opinion matters more than the, us urban folks. <laughs> Uh, it shouldn't be that way, obviously, and you know, it depends on the legislator. But um, yeah, especially frustrating if uh, your elected official doesn't uh, have the same values as you. You know, what can you do? Uh, you can certainly organize your friends. Again, you know, perception is reality. So if they get a whole bunch of emails from Yale Hill County about an issue, they got to at least think twice about being against it or being as against it <laughs> as vocal. Um, similarly, you know, writing to your newspaper, uh, you will find you know, like-minded folks perhaps that read that and don't feel so isolated. And the more folks you can kind of get together uh, and it's people power is a huge difference. But um, for like Renew Oregon um, organizes statewide and so, to be able to, you know, for instance, we did a campaign where um, we had rural Oregonians specifically hold uh, little signs and take selfies and say, you know, where they were from on them. And we get to throw on social media, all of these great folks who are just like standing next to their sheep and like <laughs> standing up next to the mountain and on the coast being like, I'm a rural Oregonian and I want climate action. And it was so powerful. So your voice, again, your own, your own experience and who you are, um, we just, you know, find the way to channel it and, and kind of pick out the right uh, and interesting things about you. And that is just powerful advocacy right there. I just dropped a link into the chat of Catherine Hayhoe's uh, new-ish book, Saving Us. Um, just to, I think it speaks to this perspective because she lives in Texas and she's a, you know, a Christian and, and really her thesis is that um, it's just so important to have these conversations, you know, that like by talking to people, by not assuming, oh, this person, you know, looks a certain way, or I'm just going to assume that they don't agree with me. And so I'm just not going to go there, you know, that by having these conversations and finding that common ground, um, it's just like those conversations are so important. So that's might be a good resource. Just wanted to suggest that for all of us. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point is that we usually have more in common with legislators on both sides of the aisle than um, differences and finding those things in common that you can relate. Maybe your legislator is a gardener or also has kiddos, but finding those things that you ha have in common and finding ways to start the conversation there, especially if you have a tricky legislator, um, just building that relationship, even if they're not necessarily with us now, maybe they will be down the road. You used to, Emily said she used to interface with ranchers in rural Texas for nonprofit conservation orgs. So that's right up her alley. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, well, it's nine o'clock. I think we're going to post um, one action that you can take tonight, which is um, if you have just a few minutes as we jump off um, to send your legislators an email. Just right now, you can just ask them for to keep the ball moving on climate change. We have um, a template you can use um, with kind of all of the bills that Families for Climate is prioritizing this session. Um, and if you just have five minutes after the call, it's pretty quick and easy. Oh, Leonard has it posted um, in the chat for us. So if you do nothing else tonight and you're feeling really motivated, we'd love for you to um, send your legislator, um, legislators emails and um, BCCS or just, you know, put a little smiley face in the chat and let us know you've done it. But um, we'd love to, it's like those little dopamine hits when we hear that someone has submitted an a, um, email or letter to the editor. So, oh, that's a great question. Where do we find our legislators contact info? Um, you, let's see. Sorry, I'm reading all of these comments. We can share um, a link for where you find your legislator right now.
You can also Google um, find my legislator and there is a Brad has popped the legislator look up right in the chat. Easy peasy. Thank you, I Brad. Love, I love everyone who's so much quicker than me at searching and posting. Thank you, Brad. Well, thank you so much, um, Julia, Brad, Nora, everyone. This was so great. I'm so happy you took the time. Um, and we will follow up. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to follow up with us. We want to make sure you are. Um, feeling like you have everything you need to be effective advocates. Thank you all for Thanks holding. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Your interest.